Hey gang, we are in Southern Illinois right now and we're just passing through a little town called Milstadt, Milstadt, Illinois. And just south of here was a little hamlet called Saxtown. And it is there that in the 1800s, a family was brutally murdered, an ax murder. They were all killed in this little cottage, this little cabin. I wonder if this is the cemetery where we're going to be going afterwards because we're actually going to the actual site where this happened. The owner of the property has been good enough to meet us there and let us access where this happened. He, his ancestors were neighbors at the time. And actually, I think his great uncle, or we'll find out, they're, they're, everybody was a suspect in this crime. The murderer was never caught. And this is gonna be like a who's done it. A very interesting story. But the man's name is Randy Eckert, and he's been good enough to meet us there, and we'll talk about it with him. So we'll turn it back on when we get there. Hey gang, I am in a little hamlet I was describing on the drive here called Saxtown, and I'm here with Randy Eckert, who is actually one of the descendants of, you know, the family line goes back here, right? To Correct, uh, yes. this whole area. And Randy owns this farm now. This is the place where a brutal event happened back in the 1870s, I think it was. I think it was 1874. 1874, and it was a family of, well, it was a father uh, and his son and his wife and two children. But going back, let me just give a briefing on the story and jump in if you want at any point. So what happened was, well, let's start with Carl. His name was Carl Steltzreda, Steltzenreda. How do you, first of all, there's many pronunciations for this last name. We'll go. Yeah, around here it was commonly called, I think, Steltzenritter. Steltson Redden? Ritter. Ritter. Steltson Ritter. Ritter. They've probably never seen it spelled, but yeah. that's what, you know, through time. That's so we'll go with that. Steltson Ritter. If you want to put a comment with your own German pronunciation, go for it. So Carl was born back in 1809 in a little German town called Hilla. And from there, he grew up as an adolescent. He met a woman named Maria. They got married. They had children. They had a farm. None of the kids would make it to their adulthood except for their son, Fritz. Now, they had some tragedy that already befell them there. The first house, the little, little cottage they built, burned down. They think it was an arsonist. Carl was actually, even back then probably, he was a little... It was kind of honorary, and we get in a lot of arguments, so you, you have to wonder. But then they he re rebuilt the house on its foundation. They were in the house, of a big storm came through, lightning hit the house, they barely got out alive as it burned down. And they were like, you know what, this place is cursed, this whole country, we've had it, and we're gonna go to America. So they ended up on a ship with all their belongings, they started out in New York, where you come through as immigrants, right? Ellis Island, and they made their way near here to St. Louis. St. Louis is just to the north, northwest of here. What, about 15 miles? It's not that far. I'd say 15 miles, 20 minutes. Yeah, 20 yeah. minutes. They didn't like St. Louis. Well, St. Louis was where, well, St. Louis is the, where the Mississippi River, the Missouri River, it's the confluence of those two rivers. And back in the mid 1800s, man, that was the early 1800s, especially, that's where all the, the fur traders were coming out of to go to the frontier, to the Northwest, up against the current of the Missouri River. You know, guys like Hugh Glass, all those famous stories and the famous keel boatsmen, it was a rough and tumble place and also a lot of pollution. They were burning coal and it was crime and they're like, they heard of this place, this little enclave here. It was a hamlet called Saxtown. And it was, it was I think Milstadt was here just to the north at the Milstadt time. Milstadt at that time, Milstadt was called Centerville. Centerville. Yeah. And they it, had to change the name because there was, there was another a, town. Already existing Centerville, yes. Centerville. Centerville. So they came to Saxtown and Saxtown was like reliving your life in Germany. Everybody here was German. They tried to make it like Saxony, I think you said. Right, Germany? it's called Saxtown because in theory, all the people immigrated from Saxony, Germany 
and they had their own little home here right in their own little community like you said it just was like they like being over in germany so everything was great we had mom and dad we had carl maria we had fritz and they bought this land right where we are standing and they built a little cottage really like a log cabin with with the oak and looked like mud and mud and harsh air straw whatever the straw whatever was found you would jam yeah. it in between to keep the weather out and they built this big barn which we're going to see which is right over here and things were great carl was very frugal just like i'm german you know germans are known to be frugal carl was extra frugal saving every penny and maria would make all their own clothes they wouldn't go out they wouldn't spend any money so they were slowly over 20 20 some years they were saving a bunch of money because their farm was doing well. So what would happen is we had a depression come back then and all, everybody here was hurting and he became kind of the local banker or call him the loan shark. Kind of like a loan shark. Yeah. yeah. So of course he was making interest and he would borrow uh, the neighbor's money and he would borrow far and wide all this money. So things were going well and then Maria passed away. And that was very hard on Carl. Carl kind of became withdrawn. He was already cantankerous. He was already kind of a, an argumentative guy. Now it was, that was just accelerated. And he kind of gave the farm over to Fritz. I mean, he lived here, but he's like, I'm gonna continue the money lending and do what I'm gonna do. And Fritz, you and Anna, you, you guys run the farm. So they all lived together, all five of them here. And again, things were kind of moving on. And then from time to time, there would be what's called, well, at the time, a farm auction. And this was like the county fair. Everybody would come together and meet. It was a social event and they went there. And again, this was an opportunity for Carl to, hey, let's find some customers for our money. And then I think you, we were talking, you had mentioned there was there was an early inheritance that came to the family that caused a rift in the family. And I'll start with that. The brothers, I think his name was Charles. He lived a ways from here. Their brother in New York owned a liquor store, a liquor operation. He died with no will, no children. So these two brothers, Carl and his brother, were fighting over the money. And it got settled, but it resulted in, in the brothers being estranged. They would not be on speaking terms. And the one brother, Charles, moved away from here. Maybe that's why. And But, you know, they had more money. And then came another inheritance. And this was right before this farm auction. And by the way, in those days, there was a lot of gossip. Neighbors would talk to each other. And the gossip was that they got gold bars. And when Carl came to the farm auction talking about, hey, do you want to, in his German accent, do you want to, does anybody need money? I've got $800 or I've got a bunch of money. And he's carrying this basket, kind of heavy. That's low, you know, it has like a, 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 a handkerchief over it. And everyone's like, oh, that's where the gold is. And he, they all thought he was carrying gold bars. Who knows what he had in there? But anyway, just before he left, there was a guy named Ben Schneider, one of the neighbors, and Ben said, I'd like to get some potato seedlings. And Carl said, come back tomorrow. Uh, we'll come, come to the farm here and, and we'll take care of that. So Ben came the next day. It was a, actually a beautiful day. It had been kind of cold and he came right here and he knocked on the door and no answer and he's poking around and it was really strange. So he, the door was unlocked. So he went in the front door and he looked down and right there lying on the floor was Fritz and his head was nearly cut off. They were, yeah, old stories go, they were just severely hatcheted or axed up and it was just something you'd never want to see. Right. Even the children, it was, and you know, the, the, why would why would people do such destruction and kill people so bad? Because the people they were killing probably knew them. They now, probably, that's a good point. They probably knew them because the door was open. It was not locked. Plus, from what I understand, the roads were completely flooded and with the mud and you'd have the horses or the, the, the spring wagons, it was impassable. So they were like, it had to be somebody they knew 
it had to be somebody local. And also, I had heard they had a dog. They yeah, a big dog. Uh, Newfoundland. It was I a think large it, dog. Large yeah, dog. I don't know, but they said the dog would not be friendly to anybody on the first meeting. So, again, evidently, it's pointing to the dog knew who the right. person was, and supposedly, just from hearsay from living around here forever, that uh, the person stayed overnight with them. And when they were sleeping, attacked, I think they said, you know, the strongest, uh, the Carl first, and then the right. old man was in a single room in the house, and then they attacked him, and then the mother and the children were in the bed yet, and they attacked right. them in the bed. Well, he found Fritz there. His head was nearly cut off. His One of his hands was cut off, so he was probably in a defensive struggle. They found Carl in the door frame, and this was only a three room. It was a big, for a cabin it was big, but there were only three rooms, low ceiling, and they found Carl in the door frame on the floor, and there was a hatchet mark in the hard oak. You were talking about the oak, that, that it was like hard right, as rock, right. right? It was green. They cut it green, and then it, it gets hard, and it will not rot. So there was a hatchet mark in the door, and they could tell it was a guy that was, let, well, a person, wouldn't be a woman, was left-handed. So they deduced that. And then, like you said, they found Anna with the, and it said, the history is that the little baby was still in her arms, clutched, and little Carl with a K, uh, the little boy was there. They were, they were all bludgeoned, murdered to death. Actually, Carl was where, where Fritz was hatcheted up. Carl was stabbed to death. I think they said there were maybe almost a hundred stab wounds in him. So it was a brutal scene here. So now you've got these, and, and here's kind of where the story turns. We wonder, you know, here's where it becomes the big who done it. So Ben, what does he do? He doesn't look around. He sees the house has been turned upside down. He runs out of here. He runs about a mile away to his brother's house who happens to be a neighbor and his name is George. So he's like, George, George. And George's like, hey, settle down. So two other guys were standing there at the house and there were the, these two minor brothers that were house, they were staying at the home of George and one, they were the Killian brothers, Charles and another, I think his name was George. And they were like, oh, let's all go see. So they all come back here, but they're afraid to go in the house. They're like, we better wait for the sheriff or something. So they sent word for the sheriff, word was spreading, and the first person of authority to come was a guy named Isaiah Thomas, not the basketball player that used to play on the Pistons. Isaiah Thomas was a young school teacher, justice of the peace, and as soon as he came, they he went in, he took charge of the situation, and then they all followed him in there, and they're all like, and two interesting reactions. One of the guys we were talking about, Killian, George Killian, he he was morbid. He wanted to see this. He wanted to see the bodies up close, and they had put just put sheets on him to cover him. And he and they're like, "What are you doing? What what do you? Oh, I want to see. I want to see. There's blood coming out of his ear. Oh, it smells weird. Can I can I go see the babies? You know?" And they're like, "Dude." And then the other guy, the brother of of, of Ben, the other George Schneider, he was like fainting. He was like, oh my gosh, it's, this is so horrible. I can't, I can't even fathom this. And he actually fainted, whether he fainted or not, who knows. So the sheriff comes and this whole thing starts unraveling and, and the villagers, there are in, hundreds in of, theory, it, I think it took right? the sheriff a day or two to get here day, because day the roads were so here. impassable. Yeah. And they said at the time, like a crowd of maybe three, 400 people had gathered so if there was any evidence to be found, everybody just had trampled, tra trampled it. it. And yeah, it was, a it was. It was James Hughes was the sheriff. And you're absolutely right, because in those days, it was the newspaper men, the people, they wanted to see the gore, and they would just trample up the whole scene. So, well, we didn't have DNA or forensics back then, but whatever tools they had, they were, they were like you said, trampled apart. Now, there are other suspects that kind of came into view. There's another neighbor, and his name was Fred Volz. I think it was Volz or Volz. And he lived a mile away, and he was acting strangely, too. And he was like, no, I don't want to come over there, and I'm too busy. And it would, it would turn out that they would find a blood trail 
with tobacco leaves and people in the day used tobacco leaves to put on their wounds or band-aid a wound leading straight to his place. They're like, oh, it's gotta be him, George Volz. And there, he had a farmhand named John, John something, um, Afkin, I think Afkin it was. Afkin was the name, right. John right. Afkin. And John Afkin was a grubber, and a grubber is the kind of the guy who digs out tree stumps, and he was an expert with an ax. So it's like, oh, it's gotta be those guys. And they were acting strangely. And anyway, so, of course, they were not cooperating. No one, it's all gossip, it's up for grabs. So they all end up at the funeral. And by the way, we're gonna see the barn here, right here, where they made the coffins and laid the bodies out. And at the funeral, there were a thousand people at the funeral. And of course, he was there. And he, as the funeral was just finishing up, as the priest was giving the final eulogy, the, the sheriff, deputies come constables and they arrest Fred this Fred guy and they bring him in along with this John guy so the to make a long story short they just start arresting people left and right Hughes and he's desperate to find the killer and he's just going on hearsay and hunches and the list just goes on and on and the trail of suspects would end up all the way at Carl's brother's house because they were in a feud. And by the way, going back to Fred, Fred had, uh, I should have added this, Fred had taken a loan out from the loan shark. Right, Carl, I, I heard, I think they were about to, well, it was on his farm. It's on and his they farm. And they were gonna try to take possession of the farm right, right. before this happened. So that really points a finger. He put a lien on the farm and then yes. he said, I'm gonna take your farm Fred and your family with your five kids. And by the way, Fred's sister was married, uh, that he was uh, Fred's wife. His sister, uh, her sister was Carl's wife. Carl's wife, right. So, so they were it's related, like, brother -in -law. they kind of, yeah, brother-in-law. So anyway, bad blood, owed the loan. And in my opinion, that's probably the top suspect because of the blood trail and because of the, you know, how many times have you heard people killing people they owe a lot of money to? But you guys, there's books, there's, you know, we'll give references in the description box of books to, you can read up on this and make your own conclusion. They never caught the killer. And, and this investigation and case kept going on and on and reopening all the way to the state attorney. And uh, it, it just, they never, they never figured it out. Isaiah, the last thing to mention, Isaiah Thomas, many years later, would come forward again and resurrect all this and would be sued because of slander. And this whole town was just a whirlwind. It, it had to be 20 or 30 years of right. strife here. I remember hearing that supposedly this story was on the front page of a New York paper. It was yeah. that severe, that heinous, that this was nothing like that had ever happened before. So it was a big, big story. And that's why they wanted to find, you know, somebody who did it. and. They, they were unable to do that. Right. So let's take, we're gonna look at a couple things. We, well, we're gonna do three things. We're gonna look at where the house was because it's not there. We're gonna look at the actual barn and we're gonna go to the cemetery. So let's start by taking a look at where the house was. And let's walk over here. Now, right now there's a cottage And it is sitting basically on the location. Oh, well, this is farm country. Gotta love it. So, so, Randy, this house right here is sitting right on where the original right cabin on where was. The original cabin was yes. It's smaller than the original cabin. Okay. And uh, I think the cabin was tore down like in about 1960. Okay. And then the family erected this small cottage here, and uh, they lived in the cottage till 1986 when I bought the property. Okay. It's interesting to find what why we're really going back to it is uh, I had some excavation work done, and while they were doing the excavating, they actually found the old house uh, where the stones were that the house sat on. So the old house was actually bigger than the house that exists here. And here's a sample of some of the stones. It was sandstone, and they put together a foundation out of that. And uh, wow, they said the house maybe went back another 10 feet and came out maybe another 15 feet. So, 
Interesting. Very so, interesting. So if you look at the, and, and it, you say it was built on the original foundation, but not back here. So this was coming out farther and then was coming this way. Right, maybe 10 feet out in the back and right. 15 feet on the side. So, so this corner, large for a log if you just took this corner of the house here and just pulled it out, 45 degrees, another 10 or 15 feet to about where we're standing. So that would be a huge cabin with only three rooms, very low ceilings. That had to be really odd. Here are some more of these stones I see. Yes. Look at that. So those are all the original, and those were in the ground, foundation those stones. Those were in the ground, right. That's what they'd set the logs on and square it up and uh, wow. go up in the air from there. And there's a creek back there, right? That's where yes, they would get is. their water. That was referenced through. That's where they went back in this woods and uh, they went back there and cut down some oak trees and they sawed them up in the barn. And that's where they made the coffins at. And the bodies were actually in the barn for a day or two because again, time right. travel was so slow. You know, they didn't know what to do. Everybody was in a panic. What are we going to do? And right. And they left the bodies, from what I understand, in the house the way they were for at least a day or two because right, they kept bringing people. Right, for people the right people to come to and, look and, and see and what they And witness and get the reaction, right? Right, see, you know, right. Are they going to be free? Are they going to be suspect or are they going to be innocent? Right. So. Well, let's take a look at the barn. Okay. I'll follow you. So, from what I understand, there were three coffins made. One coffin was for Carl. The next coffin was like a two-person coffin, and they made it out of oak from for from the Fritz. Trees saw it in the back. Yeah. Right for Fritz and his wife Anna, and then the other, the last coffin, they put the two kids together, little Anna and little Carl. Okay, yeah, I had actually never heard that. I'd never heard any detail. On I don't know coffin. if it's true, but I was right, in you know, my after research. All these years, it's who knows? Like 150 but years, I believe. I would be interested to, to know if there are five separate coffins or not. Everybody on the channel, if you want to look up the story or research it, let us know. So here is the barn, guys. So I'm going to start by, you know what? I'm just going to jump out here so people can see the front of the barn. I'm going to come right back. And literally, it's this this road here was probably, you know, a little tiny dirt for spring wagons and horses in the day. And then, look at that, all original guys. This is this is all where it happened. And up there, that's where there was a door, and you could see that rail system, and that's where they would. Uh, there would be a rope coming down to the ground and they would pull the hay up. And then they would bring it through that door. Yeah, let's take a look inside. Oops, sorry. I'll let you go first. Okay. We do have some artifacts out here. Okay, this was found in the barn and this is supposed to have been a door from the old house. Look at uh, it's that. been verified by the door hardware. The original that door. That would go back to that era. So the murderer would have pulled that open. His hands would have touched that. Look at that. So that's from the family. Isn't that interesting? And I, I noticed on the interior. There's, there's a green a color paint. And look at that hardware. More, another hardware feature. Yeah, and it's painted green. Do you think it was green in the day? That's paint. definitely an old color from the 20s. I don't know going back in the 1800s, but it could have been. It could have been. Uh, nice. Here's some structure pieces from the barn. Uh, they're all oak. They were notched out. You know, there was really no use of nails. They uh, right. could drill, hand drill the holes in there and put this was to hang the harsh harness on and whatever. So, yeah, so look at how that's notched in there. Isn't that interesting? Okay, here and on the look ground. At this, look at this. Tell us about this. As you can see, that was to clean the mud off of your shoes when you would go into a house. And this is, and I believe it is, this is the mud scraper from the log cabin when the family was in there and got murdered. This was at the house. Um, 
You can see it's got concrete on top, but underneath it's sandstone. Oh yeah. And again, it's been verified the metal work here that was hand forged and it would date back to the 1850s. And wow. uh, I'm sure that was definitely from this site. This is it. So if that could talk, you would know. You would know would who did it. Story. And look at that. This That is, look at that. Look at the sandstone. Very fascinating. You know, when you see original things like this, it kind of brings you back. It does, it does. Time kind of stand, stood still there with that piece. Yeah. Let's take a look inside. Okay. This poor old barn as it is now, it's for storage, but you can see the structure, which look is so this. fascinating. Wow. You can see a pin here and a pin here like i said they would be pinned oh, look at that yeah. the wood was hand hewn it was green and when it uh seasoned it's it's like hard as a rock and it just does not rot so that's one reason they did that here this was actually in the barn this is an old horse collar and if you can zoom in there you can see there's a hole in there and there's actually straw in there and I mean, the Germans were frugal. They did not spend money for anything. Right. They had straw on the farm. They would stuff that with straw. And this was used as a harness for the mules when they would do plowing. And here's other pieces of the reins and the harness straps that were found in this barn. Uh, I've got a piece So that, they're all original. They're all, yeah. Yeah, they are all yeah. original. This, these are artifacts. I got a piece at home. It was a round disc that was at a connection joint uh -huh. on the range and it was brass and on that it has US and I'm thinking that would have been US gallery. Right. So I guess when the Civil War was over, you know, we're not gonna throw these harnesses away. We're gonna no bring way. them home to the farm. Just like the guns, you know, they would keep right. the, they would keep their guns. Right, right. Look at that. Let's but take yeah, a poke in here. Tell you some stories. Look at the way these beams are constructed. So, so there's the second floor, obviously, and that would be used to store probably hay and feed. Or no, actually the feed was heavy. That was more the down here. Would be, these are like two granary rooms. Right? Oh, here. Yeah. Okay. That makes there's sense. There's another granary room. Let's check that out. Oh, yeah. So how high would they would the grain go, I wonder? Probably they had the doorway filled with something. Right. You can see there's a rail here. And oh. they would put hunks of wood the higher they needed for the oh, grain. Yeah, there they would you go. Look at they that. They would hopefully fill it for winter, you know, as good as yeah. their crop was. Isn't that interesting? We've got an old horseshoe. Look at some of these artifacts. What do you suppose that is? Huh. Or stripping I think I something. Like a brush. Yeah, brush for the horse, right? Yeah. Well, some see. more harness pieces. Yeah, these are all from Carl. These are artifacts, guys. So yeah, this actually this floor right here where we're standing is probably where the coffins laid. The three coffins, or however many coffins they had, were were laid out here on this floor and where you're viewing now that was a stable that's where the horses the mules would stay over in. here right over there they'd let them in and out that door okay well let's go up let's see okay. that ladder so this is where they would store all the hay right right this is where they put the hay up and they actually had holes in the floor to throw it down oh okay to the animals all right let me uh I'm going to hand you this. Grab him. There you go. You can point it wherever you want. Well, it's pretty sturdy. Real sturdy. It's been here probably 150, 60 years. Yeah. And as you look in here, there actually is no structure. You've got the roof rafters. Okay. And we've got this one beam right here in front of us. It goes horizontal from side to side, and that's what's holding the building together. I mean, it's just amazing Look that it's that. laid up here all these years. Yeah, it's a cross. It's a. It's like a cross beam. Right. And it I, is, I believe it's under. Remember. It 
looks like it's probably under tension, keeping the walls from coming out. It's, yes. Right? If, if, that would, if that would fail, the roof would kick out and the walls would kick out. Exactly. If you can kind of get a shot there, I'm trying to okay. wedge it out. And that's actually, instead of some bolts, some riveting, whatever, that joint is holding that together. They kind of okay. wedged out a triangle. Oh, in here? There, and they wedged out a triangle Let's see. on the top. Yeah, it's actually on the top. See, it, oh, it yeah. overlaps in here. Oh, Maybe yeah, look get, at that. Yeah. Let's see if we can see there. Interesting. So they evidently knew what they were doing. Like 150, 60 years later, that is holding this far enough. What are all those spots, the white? Mud dauber nests from a wasp. Oh, really? Wasps are called mud daubers, yeah, and whenever it rains, they'll get uh, oh. some mud and they will build a nest. And uh, I think they actually hatch and they grow in there and okay. come out as big mud daubers. Funny. So here's the hole that would come down to another, looks another like a mezzanine, a mezzanine type of level. Look at these, yeah, all these joints are dolls, like pins. They're, yeah, they call them pins. Look at that. And that was green Look oak, and one. that is still holding it. This one's sticking out. I mean, it's uh, it's amazing, their knowledge. And probably the reason this barn's standing is they overstructured them so much with the main structure. Right. You know, nowadays they'll cut pennies, and that's what causes buildings to fail. You know, if we yeah. can make it thinner, if we can do less holes or a smaller diameter. So they would bring the hay up, oh, let's see, from the open door over from there. open door in the end, there'd be And there'd the track system. Down, and that track system, so, and the rope would come down here behind us, out and there would be mules there. Right, so the mules would pull the, do all the work, pull the rope, right, and then... Pull the hay up and pull the hay into the barn, uh, the area where they wanted to dump it. Right. Great. All right, let's head outside. Okay. I'll follow you. Okay. So I don't step in the wrong place. <laughs> Although the floor, the floor feels pretty it's solid. A head yeah, oh, I'm 6'5. Yeah, ah! We hold a couple times a hay. Look at that, that's where that track system comes in. Get a good shot of that. Yeah. Remember that would run, I don't know. That's the, and that's the original track. Right. Look at that. Sounds like Amazon's here, or the garbage truck. Yeah. <laughs> you got it, we're out here in the country. Yeah. Even Amazon, or FedEx, I should say. Okay, I'm gonna give you this. Thanks. Oh, let's see. That's one just like it. This here? Yeah. Oh, look at that. Yeah. The wheels still turn. Boy, that's beefy. That is beefy. All right. Well, let's head outside and. Do you have time to hit the cemetery real quick? I've got time. Awesome. We gotta, we gotta make this show complete. All right. Okay. Next stop, cemetery. Okay. All right. Okay, we're coming up on the cemetery. Give us a little history of this cemetery. Okay, it's Fry Vogel Cemetery, named after the people that donated the land for the cemetery. And it belongs to the Zion Church that is in Malstadt. And, uh, the family got buried here, and they're still buried in an unmarked grave. And the family from Germany paid for and sent a tombstone to Walnut Hill Cemetery right. in Belleville. And so there's a really nice tombstone at Walnut Hill Cemetery in Belleville with no bodies. And right. out here there's an unmarked grave where the family's buried with no tombstone. Nobody would pay to move the tombstone from Belleville to here. Right. The church would not let them move the bodies from here to Belleville, so... Oh, they wouldn't let them move? It was the church that said... years later. Oh, yeah, here it is. Free Vogel Cemetery. 
So that it was the church that said, no way, yeah, you're, bodies, you yeah, are not. Assumed. Look at all those old stones. This is, so there's an old part and a new part, it looks like. Right. Yeah, well, let's, uh, let's park it right here and yeah. keep it going. Interesting. Let's have a look, guys. Beautiful day. Look at this. Wow. Those are 1800s, that's for yes, sure. They are very well maintained cemetery. Um, the church has a retired men's club, and they have been coming out here and upriding these stones. You can see the one in front of us. Was right. Broke, right. And they've uh, glued it back together. And a lot it up. Of a lot of them had fallen over, and I think they're just about done. I don't see any really laying down or that are in disrepair. It's beautiful. And look at all in German. Look at the inscription. Yeah, that one reads very well, yeah. This one reads pretty good, too. Here, I'm German. I don't know German. I don't remember my German, but I see 1855 and 59. So that's before, yeah. That's the before. Murders yeah. occurred 1874. Yeah. Look at how they're all lined up perfect. They didn't used to be. Yeah, the church put many years. It was a mess years ago. Raising huh? them up. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay, you look to your right. You can shine the big oak trees. That was always what everybody say. Oh, they're buried over by in the corner by the big oak. Tree. Oh, is that where they're at? Yeah. So okay. Let's head this way. Now there's a memorial stone that it is said that. Carl's brother, Charles, you know, he got the inheritance of, he got like three inheritance in the end. Mm -hmm. He must have had a lot of money, but he did pay for a memorial stone for the family. Now, is that here or is that? No, that's up? placed at Walnut Hill and so, so that's at Belleville, there okay. There is no stone there. No stone. Well, we want to see where they're buried, the real. Look at these stones, guys. Here's one that you can read a little more. 1807 to 18, maybe 83. Friedrich Lindager, Lindager, maybe. Yeah, most of them you can't read. I know you guys like to see the tombstones, so we'll do, we'll show a few of these. Look at that one. Do you think that's original there? That's probably what happened and why it's in good shape. So anybody German, it would be great to get a translation of this. I'm betting that's a prayer. 1811-1866, Marie. That is in really good shape. It is. Oh, look at this. Look at this, look at this. There, this, so this is a stone for them? No, this is a stone oh. for... Uh, Who's that? Be Fritz's wife, the grandfather. That was his wife. She died in 1866, right before. Before this. Oh, this is for, um, it says Maria, Maria. Christy. Oh yeah, that's right, Carl's wife. Carl's wife, right. Of course. So she was given a stone here, so this is where she is buried. Yeah, of course, and there it says 1803 to 1866. Now, as I recall, Carl was 1809, so she was six years older than him, depending on the, the months. Right, right. Interesting. Oh, yeah, so this is Maria. 
And she, of course, was not here for that. So we've got this large, vast, empty area here, right here. Okay. This is where the family is buried in this un unmarked grave. All right, so it's right in front of us here. And it's interesting, you it's can right see here. the stones behind there. And you count one, two, three. And you were talking about three coffins, so this area would have one, two, oh, three yeah. spaces. Oh, yeah, because if coffins. you look at this row here, boom, boom, boom. And, and, and there you see Maria right there. And then we follow the next one. And that would be one, two, three, four in here. So it is a big blank space. And did you, did you just, do people just, are they guessing at that or do people know that they're? No, it's it's in the church. Uh, it's yeah, in the yeah. church, Mark. You know, okay. plans of the cemetery and say who's buried where. So, yeah. So this is this, where. This is definitely where they are. This is where they are, guys. Like I said, they're in the unmarked grave here and then at Bevelin Walnut Hill Cemetery. Right. There is a monument to them. Right. And I think on one side it says something like in German, the murdered family. Oh, so they're, yeah. So they're really serious and sad that they, you know, had to go to the extent to put that on the tombstone. Right. Really says, you know, the way they were feeling at that time and day. Well, here they are, guys. We are at the actual grave. This is where all the people were standing, a thousand people. And for Carl, for Carl and for Fritz and Anna and their two kids, little Anna and little Carl, Hopefully they are resting in peace. We're going to close it out here, gang, and everybody be safe.